Well, good morning again. It's good to see all of you here. Good morning. Are you guys awake? Good morning. Good morning. I got to tell you, um, I'm so I'm so glad to be here with you this morning and to share this message because it's been on my heart. Um, and we're talking this month about building a house of God. And I'm starting with what kind of house is it? It's a house of grace. And you might be thinking, why are we starting with grace in a series that, whether you know it or not, because of the time of year, you might suspect is about stewardship? Well, it all begins and ends with grace. And we'll talk about that after reading the Word of God this morning from uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 15. So would you please rise as we, as we read about one of the earliest church fund drives ever to happen. So... Paul writes, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations, and they gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in the Excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our, God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this manner. Last year, you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish that, the work so that your, that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what has, one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but there might be equality at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who has gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. The word of our Lord. Please be seated. So what has grace got to do with it? Right? What is it about grace? And part of our problem when I pose that question is most people today have an incredibly truncated, narrow view of grace. We think of grace, when I say the word grace, we think of forgiveness, right? Many of us. That's the first thing we think of. God's grace means we are forgiven. And that's true. But that's not everything about grace. Grace is so much more than forgiveness. One of my favorite uh, theologians and inspirational people for me is this guy named Dallas Willard. And if you want to read some great stuff, read Dallas Willard. But he wrote this, Grace is not just about forgiveness. If we had never sinned, we would still need grace. Grace is God acting in our life to do what we cannot do on our own. Grace is what we live by, and the human system won't work without it. The saints use grace like a 747 jet burns gas on takeoff. If we want to live powerful lives of God, we not only have to experience grace, because grace is here. That's not the problem. Grace is here, and it's available to all of us. We live in it. We breathe in it. It overflows us. It fills us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Grace is ever-present. So the question is, 
why do most Christians, to misquote somebody, live what seems like lives of quiet desperation? How come their lives don't seem as powerful as they should be? How come churches aren't as grace-filled as they should be? Because the church is no more than the collection of people. When, when Paul is writing the Corinthians, when he's writing the Philippians, he's not writing to a building, he's writing to a people. And we are the people of this church. We are Brunswick. So how do we live more powerfully? How do we live more grace-filled lives? And I want to use the image of the Great Salt Lakes. You know, the Great Salt Lake in Utah, the Dead Sea in Israel. I've had the opportunity to see both. And i got to tell you, the only people who go visit both of those places are tourists and people who are extracting minerals from those places because they're dead. Um, Quick hint, the only people who actually go into the Dead Sea are tourists who want to bob because it's seven times more saline than, than the ocean. And let me tell you, you don't want to be one of those people who bob because you get out and the salt crusts on you in places, well, where it's uncomfortable. So <laughs> consider just watching. It's kind of fun. And if you had, you know, if you're right next to your hotel, maybe, but not so much. But it's a dead place. Ted, who's led tours over there, probably can tell you, nothing grows in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives, nothing swims. It's too saline. It's too full of minerals. But the Dead Sea and the Great Salt Lake and other, these other places all have fresh water running into them constantly. Resources are running into them constantly. Their problem is they have no outlet. And this is what happens, I think, to so many churches and individuals in churches, Christians, good, wonderful people. And when they ask me, well, how come I don't feel the Spirit? I tell them, well, where's your outlet? What are you doing? How are you exercising the grace? How are you becoming a channel to that grace? How are you staying fresh? Because the Christian life is not just about experiencing the grace, not just having the grace poured in, because God pours it in. God has poured in so many blessings into our lives. I look around this room, and I see so many people with so many talents, so many resources, so much great stuff. People I want to hang out with. But how come we don't experience the power how come it feels like we're stalled at times? How come we're frustrated? It's because we don't have enough outlets. We don't exercise it. It's not that we can't, it's because we don't. Now we can't say we can't because it's a pleasant excuse. It really is. I gotta tell you, my default and this one I want to confess to you and come before you, is that when I'm under stress, when stuff piles on, is to bunker, just get it done, instead of reaching out and asking for help. I'm a guy. I don't want to pull over and even ask directions. I, I talked to Holly and uh, Bob Clark yesterday at, uh, at Dick Sims' uh, memorial service. And I said, oh, you don't have GPS? He goes, no, we pull over and ask directions if we need it. And I go, really? <laughs> and that's hard for me to imagine. Not because the not having GPS part, it's the pulling over and asking directions part. It's hard. But we've got to change our habits. We've got to work at having more outlets for our grace. Our grace comes in many forms. Our grace comes in our time, our talents, and our treasures. So how do we do it? We can get clues from this passage from Paul. Paul writes to these guys, these, this church, the Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, and Paul talks about Jesus. Talks about how Jesus made sacrificial giving to allow us to be saved. 
He spent into poverty, is the line. And how did he do it? I think what speaks eloquently to it is this passage from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. In your relationship to one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made hum- in human likeness. Now, that word servant is an interesting word. That word servant not only means servant, it means slave, doulos. It's a great word. Slave for us. So that we could be saved. That's Christ. In the very description of Jesus at Bethlehem, when he came down, he came not to be the son of Herod, the king. He came down to be the son of a carpenter and a little woman. This young girl in a manger, in a smelly stable for us. So that we could experience full grace on his path. He divested himself of power, of wealth, of knowledge. Have you thought about that? He limited himself to be fully human, to be that child. To go through all of the things that human beings have to go through. To fully experience the pain and suffering, the depravities. So, he gives us the example of how to live this life with many outlets, with gratitude. And that's where it really starts, starts and begins. If you want to live in a flowing stream that's full of grace and where you can experience that grace and use that grace to power a, a full life, we have to not only give grace in every measure, but work on it. And, it's a, and it comes down to the most basic of all things, which I know this church can do. It's the continual practice and response to love. You know, giving of anything, and let's talk about the most important thing in a lot of people's lives, money. Dare I talk about it? Just today? You know, if I was like Christ, you know, almost 16 of his, uh, I believe, 38 parables, almost half of his parables, were all about money and resources and how people are supposed to use them. I talk maybe three times a year about money, so indulge me today. Because where your money is, someone said this, your heart is also. I used to say, if you, look, if you want to know where people's money, where their hearts are, look at their checkbook. So, but since nobody writes checks anymore, okay, maybe one or two a month, let's look at your credit card statement. That's where your heart is. Because that's where you put your resources, your time, your effort. And Paul is writing this letter I joked, it's the first, it's one of the first uh, fund drives we have in the Bible. It's Paul writing to the Corinthians to raise money to feed the believers in Jerusalem. And he's telling them it's not about the false narrative. You know, ever heard the narrative, if I had more, I'd give more? Have you heard that? If I want, it, it takes the form of things like, if I win the lottery, if I win the mega ball, I, whatever the mega ball is, you know, I think, You know, if I win that million dollars, I'll give all of it away. It's like, no, you won't. Because here's the clue. Giving has nothing to do with how much you have. There are people who are incredibly generous who have very little. And there are people who are incredibly wealthy who are incredibly stingy. It plays out in many ways. One of the highest per capita givers in the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church, not PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church in general, is actually a, a church that's run by a couple of friends of mine. Uh, it's called New Life Calvary, and it's in Glen, it's the Glenville neighborhood of East Cleveland. It's the poorest part of Cleveland, and they had the highest per capita giving. 
Just imagine that. The church of Af an African American church in a destitute part of Cleveland, and they've got the, the greatest giving. They have nothing, and they give because they're joyous. I got to tell you, they do something in their se session meeting that just gives me, just makes me smile. I've had the opportunity to visit with them. They sing. Isn't that weird? But wonderful. In their session meeting, it's kind of neat. I won't ask my session to sing. Well, maybe. But it's about experience that wonderful outlet because. If we understand how grateful we should be, if we understand how much God has given to us, how much he loves us, we can't help but respond. Paul puts it in his letter to the Corinthians, I don't want you to give out of, out of guilt. I don't want you to give out of, of obligation. I want you to give out of love. Not out of love for me, not out of love for the church in Jerusalem even. I want you to give out of the love God has poured into your lives. So how do we more fully embrace the grace that God has given to us? How do we get more power out of that grace in our lives? We do it by giving, by exercising the gratitude that God has poured into us, to, by, by building and remembering how God has worked in our lives and then responding to it in tangible ways. Volunteering. We need your help here. You want to build a good church? You want to build a great church? It's not exactly only my job or the job of the leadership. It's your job to be involved. And Sunday morning isn't the only thing you're supposed to be involved in. No matter your age, no matter your physical condition, you can help. There are avenues. You can pray for us. That's powerful. You can take part. You can also give, I'll be honest. We need your support. And it's a good way to start. So just consider these four little steps. I, I found this in, in, in some stewardship stuff that really works. But the first thing is get in the habit of being involved. Get in the habit of doing stuff. Whether you're a teen and wh or whether you're an adult, get in the habit of doing, giving. Because and I've got to tell you, stewardship, stewardship is binary, but it's not only binary. It's not just yes and no, I give or I don't give. I give my time, I give my talents, I give my treasures. It's also how much and how you give that makes a difference. So get in the habit of giving. First, talk, let's talk about money because that's easy to identify. If you've never given, give today or in 24 hours. Commit to give. Become a first-time giver. You can't excel at anything until you start. Even Michael Jordan had to start playing basketball at some point in his life. You can't get good until you start. So start. And commit to starting right away. The second thing is, make it a habit. Don't just give once, give regularly. Don't just volunteer once, volunteer regularly. You know, and also realize as you volunteer, as you try things out, some things will not work out. I, my first real volunteer effort in a church was kindergarten. And while I loved it, I wasn't suited for it. I love little kids and I love working with them, but it wasn't my gift. That's okay. But try other things. Keep trying till you find your niche. Because God will be using you and make it a habit. Make it a habit to consider why yes first before no. Why should I say yes before I should say no, right? So make it a habit. Get in the habit of giving and volunteering. Because, build, and because you build up that muscle. It's like exercising. The more you exercise, the more you want to exercise, and the more you can exercise. You don't well, most of us don't just decide to go run a marathon tomorrow. We need to build up to it. They say give yourself six months to a year to get ready for a marathon. I say give yourself about five years if you're my age or older. But, you know, finally, build up to tithing your time, your treasures, 
your talents. Why a tithe? They say, well, maybe it's gone. A tithe is a great marker because if you're tithing your time, if you're tithing your money, if you're tithing your talents, that means you have to change how you live. And it makes a difference. If I make a million dollars and I give 10000 it doesn't change how I live. It's just nice. But if I, ch- if, if I give 10% of whatever I make first into the plate, if I have 10% of my time, which is an even more precious resource to the church and to the ministry of the church, it changes how I live. And that change in how I live, how I experience God, changes everything. Because, because it becomes a first fruit. There are a lot of people in this congregation I lean on that I am so grateful for that are pillars of the church that give so much of themselves but no one knows except God. But they build the church. There's someone who visits people every Monday and I'm so appreciative of their work and their quiet ministry because it makes a huge impact on the life, especially of those we don't see very often. And it's a valuable ministry, not just for those he, they visit, but also for them. I know it does something for them because it builds a stronger Christian, because they get more in touch with who they are. The volunteers for Juana on Wednesday night build something. The ones who do all the ministries, the deacons who sacrifice, because it is a sacrifice to do the ministries for those less fortunate around uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. It is a sacrifice, but it builds not just our church, but builds their life and walk in grace. So tithe. The final step, well, not the final step, but the step to, to, to work for, though, is then become extravagant, generous givers. Have huge outflowings of grace, mississippi size. You know, giving, I got to tell you, tithing is just the beginning. Tithing is just the beginning because there's a joy in saying, now, okay, I give 10% to God, my time, my treasure, my talents. But then, how can I support missionaries above that? How can I help in the ministry of the church? How can I make an impact? If you're already tithing, thank you. Thank you. That's a great start. But the question isn't, is that all I'm required to do? No. God doesn't want 10%. He wants 100%. He wants it all. And I got to tell you, there's a joy in, for me at least, every month I get, you know, emails and actual letters in my mailbox from missionaries that we support. I read what they're doing and I, I realize, you know, I have a small part of helping legislators in Washington, D.C. legislate, but also understand what it means to walk with God because I'm supporting missionaries who work there. I'm supporting missionaries who work in Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm helping missionaries who work in Cuba and all these places I can't go, but I assist and equip those who can. And then there's joy getting your hands dirty that have nothing to do with my job. But the hardest thing for me as your pastor is to do ministry that has nothing to do technically with Brunswick. But I'm also called to do that because this is my job, my calling. But my other part is the calling to be a Christ follower. And the two overlap almost completely. But my, my challenge every year to myself, my spiritual director's challenge to me often is, what are you doing for you and your relationship with God that goes beyond the bounds of your job? And my challenge to all of you is, where are you on that four-step process? I got to tell you, the further you go, the richer you become, the more grace flows into your life, and the more you experience it, I gotta tell you, the more joy you know in your life, because your life becomes more than the balance in your checkbook, it becomes rich and life filled, unlike the salt and sea. It becomes something rich, vibrant, and alive. Let's go to God right now.
Oh, precious Father, I thank you this morning that you are here with us, that you live in us and you give us lives full of grace. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to be embrace that grace in our lives. Help us to be grace givers and grace bearers. Help us, Lord, to just love you more and deepen that love by loving the world around us as you love us. Oh, Lord, we thank you. And we thank you for the opportunity to be in relationship with you. Oh, Lord, help us. Guide us and give us your son in full measure. We thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. Amen.